Hi everyone, this is uh, Peter Beal, and I just want to put together the first of what will be a number of short videos on the topic of modern art. Um, and by modern art, I'm really referring to probably most specifically art that dates from about 1860 onwards. Definitely a good, there are a few good markers. One is the uh, invention of photography, 1839. I think that's a good. Um, real basic inaugural date. Um, some others might include the post-revolutionary period in Europe, 1848, post-Civil War in America, 1865, um, Franco-Prussian War, late 1870s. Um, I'd say you can definitely mark modern art as being well underway, probably I don't know, pick a date, 1863, and Monet's um, De Janeiro and so forth. Anyway, so basically late 19th century. Um, and so that's what we're going to be focusing on the, in, on the class, focusing on the class until um, probably moving forward until about, I would say, 1990 or so. I haven't decided exactly when to, to cut things off, but definitely well into the 20th century. So this, this uh, short video is basically on the topic of art history and modern art. Um, I spend a lot of my time introducing students to the study of the visual arts. And uh, one of the most important things to sort of get underway is what art history is, kind of what it isn't. And um, in this particular video, we're gonna need to think about that in a little bit more depth because of the specific and unique aspects of modern art as opposed to um, say prehistoric art or classic uh, era art, Greco-Roman art or medieval and all of these are big generalizations but but I think that they're they serve to designate a type of art that's very different from the kinds of art we begin to see in the visual arts especially of Europe in the later 19th century. So just to begin, when we think about art history, and, and here's an example of a, of a piece that's almost universally studied uh, for any course that's going to deal with the uh, Italian Renaissance. So this is a very famous fresco, uh, part of a cycle of fresco decorations in a church in Florence in Santa Maria del Carmine. And the name of the of this particular uh, portion of the fresco cycle is uh, the, uh, called the tribute money, and it uh, is part of a series of scenes dedicated to the basically the life of Saint Peter. If you're studying Renaissance art, it's a very important kind of landmark in terms of an approach to art that focuses on art being a kind of window into um, the visual, the visual world, visual phenomena that, uh, in the in the mode that we perceive, the way that we see the world, the idea uh, in the 15th century that a piece of art was successful to the degree that it did mirror um, observable visual experience. Uh, this is a this is a new thing, and um, it's one that's going to be developed with considerable enthusiasm through the 15th, 16th. 17th and uh, through the 18th centuries. In other words, it's a, a kind of paradigm or approach that's seen as particularly invaluable. Scholars that look at this kind of uh, art, uh, from, say again, the, I don't know, the early middle 15th century, uh, pretty consistently note a number of phenomena that, you know, help explain uh, why this priority uh, existed. Um, there's little doubt when you look at the piece that the emphasis is on a believable pictorial space, um, a focus on plausible human actors within that pictorial space doing important things. Um, the sort of contemporary to this art writer, uh, Lam Battista Alberti, writes in his work on painting about the so-called Historia, I-S-T-O-R-I-A, as a a painting that, and he's focusing primarily on painting, it could apply to sculpture, for instance, as well. But this is a painting that conveys a serious moral message. 
and it does it uh, in a kind of I won't say pre-programmed, but certainly adhering to certain well-defined characteristics. And especially important is going to be um, the ability to convey important moral decisions through narrative. <clears throat> so if you think about painting, or in large part Italian art, say Florentine art, in uh, the middle, say, of the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, was born in 1452, um, if you look at art from this period, those are big priorities. The behavior of light, the depiction of nature, the believable representation of uh, space, the plausible depiction of the human form, and especially with a focus on uh, gesture, um, expression, the sort of clarity of purpose and function is really quite important. And as I said, this is a priority of many, many uh, artists and art movements uh, in Europe, really right up until well into the 19th century, and even you could argue afterward. <clears throat> art historians are interested in how things change and why they change. And so, for instance, someone studying the work of Masaccio might start asking some questions as to why suddenly patrons, people who pay for art, found this type of art interesting or valuable or you know, important, and especially in a public context, although this painting isn't particularly public in terms of its setting. There are many, many other contemporary works of art that distribute sim or display, I should say, similar uh, attitudes and tactics and use similar strategies. So it's clear that this was a public, um, this was a strategy favored by the public and favored by patrons. So if we go from, this is kind of an abrupt speeding up of the process here, but if we go from 1425, 27, thereabouts, to 1872 and Claude Monet's famous impression, Sunrise, we can see that a number of important things have changed. We could superficially note that this is an easel painting on canvas, uh, painted in what's called plein air, which means in the outdoors. Um, it's a painting <clears throat> that has no uh, discernible narrative that, that, you know, a casual observer could could locate. It is indeed a landscape, or to be more precise, a marine painting, a type of uh, category of art that was particularly popular with the Dutch. And there's probably some degree to which Dutch marine art and really lots of other examples, genre, uh, still life landscape, influenced French artists. And Claude Monet may well have been influenced by earlier Dutch artists. But he's disregarded a kind of traditional mode of representing nature. And with extremely obvious brush strokes, you know, sort of scraping into the paint, distributing with a palette knife or the handle of a brush, smearing it with a towel or fingers, as you can see in the upper left. The overall effect is not one of specificity and detail and precision in the sense that Masaccio creates his art, but instead is intended to evoke a very evanescent or ephemeral impression of a scene in front of, uh, in front of a viewer. And the, and the important thing here is to understand, and this is, I think, particularly important in thinking about the relationship of this type of painting to photography, the idea is not to get a, a super precise photographic rendering of it, but instead a more psychological impression. That is to say, it leaves the viewer with an evocation of a moment um, that is one of, or you could even argue, a conglomeration of moments. Um, that it's not a single fixed, crystallized, uh, mathematically calculable moment in the sense that the Masaccio is. So how do we get here? And that's, I think, an important uh, sort of springboard for thinking about modern art as opposed to early modern art or, or earlier. One of the most important aspects of modern art to keep in mind as we go forward, and one of the reasons for this change, is the sense of self-reflectivity, the idea that the artist isn't merely depicting subjects or trying to persuade viewers um, as to the rightness of a moral action or situation, but that the artist reflects constantly on art 
that's going to be an important thing. So Monet is basically taking apart the means by which one makes a painting, stripping it down to the bare minimum of time, bare minimum of technology, um, dispensing with the traditional precise delineations and modeling that is associated with more academic renderings of the subject. And now if we look <clears throat> at Edouard Manet's Bar the Folie Bergère, which is getting on, I think, toward the end of the Impressionist movement, Manet is a fascinating artist in lots of ways, and one of them is in the way in which his self-reflectivity seems to move in all directions at once. And all directions at once is a kind of good way of beginning to think about this particular uh, piece right here. It utilizes some of the techniques uh, that we're familiar with from the Impressionists, and in particular, it uses um, patchy, pure color, the sense of He's basically evoking rather than delineating precisely all kinds of forms, particularly in the background. Um, it depicts uh, everyday occurrences in contemporary life that one might, if you were an inhabitant of Paris in 1882, be able to see simply by walking down the street and into a nightclub or theater. Manet's genius is not, though, just in deconstructing pictorial precision in a kind of academic mode, but also in commenting on the ways in which art and everyday life intersect, and indeed in the ways that visuality in everyday life are beginning to change in its own time. So a good example of how this is working is the fact that the background of this particular piece, remember we talked about art as window, has been transformed into a mirror. Okay, so it's not a, a a vista into an infinitely distant perspective in the sense that Masaccio has it. Instead, the perspective is of a scene behind us. Um, and this is kind of interesting uh, if we put it in relation to the primary uh, figure in the painting who's staring at us. And of course, this is a barmaid. This is somebody who's uh, ready to serve whoever asks her for these uh, you know, beverages and fruit and things like that. Um, and that raises another interesting question about what is it that we buy in a sense? And, and we can do it in the material commercial sense. We can do it in the accepting and learning the, you know, the premises, the idea of the painter and the painting. There are lots of ways in which we can talk about buying. Manet presents us with a painting of surfaces and reflections and <clears throat> at the same time presents us, I think particularly in the way that he evokes the expression of the young woman behind the bar, a kind of profound emptiness and absence in all of these, uh, the sort of brilliant kaleidoscope of reflections and colors and forms. So this is another form of reflectivity, uh, a reflection, that is to say, and literally in this case, reflection, that is to say, when we look at art, we don't necessarily get what it is we're seeing that maybe the solidity and the kind of almost philosophical integrity that somebody like Alberti would have been interested in his painting is seen by Manet as an impossibility, that we're never going to get the thing that we think we're going to get. And so we're forever having to keep this a little bit, maybe a lot bit at a distance. And we're a lot like the top hat of gentleman in the upper right asking for something, and some people have speculated that he might even be asking for the attention of the young woman herself, perhaps in a sexual sense. We're asking for these things, these consumer goods and all their dizzying variety and the distractions of a Parisian nightclub. You can see, for instance, the, the feet of a trapeze artist in the upper left, this kind of thing. But that it's always at a distance. It's never going to be in depth. There's, you know, we're simply seeing reflection. And a contemporary artist, I think, today would simply go to Las Vegas or any metropolitan entertainment area and discover precisely the same thing and point those, uh, those phenomena out to us. In the next talk, I'll look a little bit more in depth at some directions in modern art and how that, um, how that idea of, of uh, reflection and, and uh, commentary on art continues.